OK. We start with Italian futurism. At the turn of the last century, innovations like electricity, X-rays, radio waves, automobiles and aeroplanes were extremely exciting. Today, we take such technological advances for granted. A hundred years ago, Italy lagged behind Britain, France, Germany and the United States in the pace of its industrial development. Culturally speaking, the country's artistic reputation was grounded in ancient, by which I mean Roman, Renaissance and Baroque art and culture. Simply put, Italy represented the past. And here we have a, a quotation uh, that comes from a futurist text. Can you imagine being so enthusiastic about technology, technology that daughter propeller? which happened. In the early 1900s, a group of young, rebellious Italian writers, artists and poets emerged, determined to celebrate industrialization. They were frustrated by Italy's declining status and believed that the machine age would result in an entirely new world order and even a renewed consciousness. Marinetti launched Futurism in 1909 with the publication of his Futurist Manifesto, which was on the front page of the French newspaper Le Figaro. The manifesto set a fiery tone. In it, Marinetti lashed out against cultural tradition and called for the destruction of museums, libraries and the destruction of feminism. Futurism quickly grew into an international movement, where well, in fact it was international from the very beginning when an Italian publishes the manifesto in France on a French newspaper. Um, and it's participated additional manifestos of nearly every type of art, so a manifesto for futurist painting, sculpture, architecture, music, photography, cinema, even clothing. We'll have a summary of that here. Futurism really simply is it embraces everything about the future and hates the past as being backward. Um, my colleague Anna, who works in drama and theatre, says that she understands that notion of you know, longing for the future and loving it and hating the past and feeling embarrassed by being backwards. She says she feels that every time she gets the train into Lincoln, that little single carriage diesel train, she sort of screams out, come on, Lincoln, modernise, get an electric railway, get a decent train. So the future um, for the futurists, remember at the time we were inventing um, transport technology, so faster trains and cars and aeroplanes. So um, it was linked with the notion of speed, youth, violence. Before we read what's on screen, think back to last week. I spoke about Clement Greenberg. Do you remember him, the art critic? And his modernist narrative of how picture planes flattened down over time and how he ignored Dada and surrealism. I suggested that maybe Marcel Duchamp's urinal might be the beginning of postmodernism, or maybe thinking uh, because it represents the, the beginning of a failure of our faith in uh, progress, and that we can, you know, we can build an unsinkable ship, we can conquer the waves. Futurism, however, sits better with the modernist narrative. Let's read the quotation. Among modernist movements, futurism was exceptionally vehement in its denunciation of the past. This was because in Italy, the weight of past culture was felt as particularly oppressive. In the manifesto, Marinetti asserted that we will free Italy from her innumerable museums. 
which cover her like countless symmetries. What the futurists proposed instead was an art that celebrated the modern world of industry and technology. They said, we declare a new beauty, the beauty of speed, the racing motor car is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace. And in brackets, it explains that the victory of Samothrace is a Greek sculpture. We could say that um, futurism does fit with Greenberg's narrative about flattening the picture plane. If you look at the image on the left, it looks kind of cubist and cubism was part of his narrative of flattening down. The futurist painters signed their first manifesto in 1910. The last name is uh, Marinetta's daughter, Elika, which means propeller. Futurist painting had first looked to the colour and the optical experiments of the late 19th century. By the autumn of 1911, Marinetti and the futurist painters visited the Salon d'Automne, Autumn Salon in Paris, and saw Cubism in person for the first time. Cubism had an immediate impact that had um, never been seen in, by these artists before. Nonetheless, the futurists declared their work to be completely original and new. And you can see in both of these pictures that um, apart from the left hand side one looking a bit cubist, there is motion in it in both of the pictures because they're embracing speed and progress and such things. Here they are, the futurist painters Boccioni, Cara, Russolo, who um, was a pioneer of sound art and Severini. Marinetti was principally um, a poet. His, so Marinetti is the founder of futurism, principally a poet. As well as being noted for their avant-garde painting, the futurists' performances were legendary for their intent to provoke, remember we're doing provocations and imaginations, to provoke and scandalize the public. Often um, encouraging audience participation, they led the way for participatory arts. They led the way for Dada, Situationism and Alan Capro's happenings all the way up to the present. That's from your seminar reading. So um, what Bishop and Groys are saying is that, um, remember, futurism comes before Dada, which we did last week. It's seven years before Dada was founded. Um, and it influences Dada Cabaret that we saw last week. It also influences something called Situationism and Alan Capro's Happenings, which we're going to do in the second part of this lecture series, and up to the present, the third part of this lecture series. I'm going to watch a video now.
OK, that was um, looking back at um, um, about 100 years later uh, in, a, in an exhibition in New York. Olivia, your hand is up. Do you have uh, something you need to say? Yeah, most people didn't know that you needed to click the button to watch the video, so I don't think a lot of people have watched it. OK. Um, thanks for letting me know. It's OK. It, it's um, stuff that's kind of repeated in, in different words. I thought it'd be good to break up my voice, but um, you can watch it on the recording uh, later or Google it and watch it on the Guggenheim website. So I will explain what it said now. The futurists set up something called serate with an E is plural, serata, uh, like on the poster is singular. Um, so up until this point, art has mainly been um, painting, sculpture, shown in a gallery, or maybe outside a sculpture, monumental sculpture, a statue and so on. Futurist activities were performance based, held in theatres, but also on the streets, as we shall see, and they toured. Events were preceded by manifestos, which is uh, declarations of their beliefs, and press releases were circulated to newspapers after the events. Between 1910 and 19 14, the Futurists organised around 20 major serati. They rejected traditional theatre as an institution and a platform for mediocrity. They're saying theatre is mediocre and they it's just a repetition of old classics. They don't like it. Imagine being bored by really old theatre, going to see Shakespeare again and again and again and nothing new. They instead sought to create dynamic fragmentary symphonies of gesture, words, noises, lights, opening up new concepts of multimedia spectacles. Uh, and I have a quotation. Futurist theatre was a violent assault on the nerves of the spectators. By eliminating the barrier of the proscenium arch, they invaded the auditorium. They took the spectators by the collars um, and shook them out of their passivity and torpor. So they're saying that people are being passive and just accepting all the old stuff and Italy needs to wake up and modernise and they're going to get off the stage and come into the audience and grab you and shake you if they need to. Um, so serata has got a similar link to the French word that we use in English, soiree, which means an evening party. And in this, they did all sorts of things, including reciting things such as uh, political statements, manifestos, musical compositions, poetry, and so on, but not just that. The first serata was in January 1910. The third was in March 1910, and this was the first to include visual arts. So the first two, there was no visual arts. It was all poetry, manifestos, performances, and so on. Um, the visual artists included Umberto Boccioni, Carlo Carra and Luigi Russolo. They all performed and they had all met uh, Marinetti the month before. Up until this point, art had really been uh, more kind of traditional forms. So the Futurist activities introduced, perhaps for the first time, performance based works. Now, here is um, a bit of study skills, really. I've put in two quotes from the Futurist Synthetic Theatre Manifesto of 1915. They're the same quotes, but they're different. Uh, why? So the first one starts, the beginning bit's different. The first one starts with really strong language, and it's, uh, it's in capitals because that's how it appears in the book that I've got this from. We think that the only way to inspire Italy with the warlike spirit of today is through the theatre. And then if we look at the next quotation, it says, we think that the only way that Italy can be influenced today 
is through the theatre. So just look at that carefully. The word theatre is spelled differently. Here it's spelled the British way. Here it's spelled the American way. And all that beginning bit about warlike spirit of today is missing from this quotation. And that's because, um, well, I can only speculate, it's because they come from different translations or, or different versions. Maybe it was updated. Um, so the first one's taken from Claire Bishop's book, Artificial Hells. And the next one is taken from a book um, called A Futurist Anthology. So just be careful when you come to quotes to make sure that you quote what you see, the original source. So um, these are from 2009 and 2012, although originally it was written in Italian in 1915. Um, but as it goes on, it's an interesting quote here. It says, in fact, 90% of Italians go to the theatre, whereas only 10% read books and reviews. But what is needed is a futurist theatre, completely opposed to the passeist traditionalist theatre that drags its monotonous, depressing processions around the sleepy Italian stages. So they say, look, everyone goes to the theatre, but we need a new theatre that's going to wake everyone up. And this is during the war, of course, um, Europe descending into World War One or well into World War One by this point. So uh, and they, they don't seem to be worried by that. They seem to say, well, let's embrace this spirit. And they wanted to overthrow bourgeois culture. Um, and he embraced populist memes like Donald Trump. The Futurist Manifesto was printed, of course, on the, the newspaper in the first instance. So that's reaching a mass audience, a popular audience. Um, Serata, these Futurist Evenings, they, they were on a stage in a theatre, but they didn't have any characters. They weren't acting. There was no plot, no story. It was just a spectacle. It was like slapstick um, and singing. Variety theatre also encouraged audience participation. Perhaps a British equivalent might be the pantomime. Both were working class or lower class and both engaged the audience. If you've been to a pantomime where maybe uh, they squirt a water pistol on the audience or um, try to embarrass people, um, speak directly to the audience. Plays don't usually do that, do they? In a Shakespeare play, they don't usually start talking to someone in the audience because there's an illusion in a play that um, another reality is going on and we're watching it. So Variety Theatre embraced heckling on both sides. The audience heckled them and they heckled back. Perhaps I think stand up comedians like Frankie Boyle or maybe Ricky Gervais or even Jimmy Carr are modern acts that similarly enrage audiences and provoke them with, um, you know, deliberately um, close to the bone, politically incorrect, um, insulting, disgusting jokes. The futurists presented themselves also as clowns. So it seems to me that the my analogy uh, with comedy and with pantomime is um, not entirely invalid. So Claire Bishop talks about variety theatre, but the futurist theatre critic Gunter Berghaus talks about political action theatre. He says, Futurist politics were performative, just as futurist performances were political. And they were very much like a variety act, uh, a cabaret, a bit like Britain's Got Talent, you know, different acts coming on and doing things more than a play like a Shakespeare play. And they it very much encouraged participation and collaboration. Part of the module aims you'll remember from the briefing is to talk about the documentation of your work in frameworks and look at it historically. Uh, here is um, a drawing of a serata in a theatre and you can see those lines represent people throwing things at the stage and on the stage they have easels so they're painting live on stage. Um, and I put this in because 
documentation is very, very hard to come by. Um, and my colleague Anna Shia, who also does a lecture on futurism for drama, um, shared her presentation with me and I found that she does have a photograph of a serata. I believe here you can see the papers being hurled in onto the audience. This is in Perugia in 1914. You can see the paintings on the stage there. So we should think about this as um, quite a, you know, a major event. They were attended. The police were put on alert hours before a serata. The theatre um, was surrounded then by police. They're expecting trouble. Marinetti and friends welcomed uh, were welcomed by local futurists at the train station when they arrived and taken to the theatre venue. The theatres were packed for an hour before the event started, and then it started with often tomatoes being hurled, insults flying and provocations. And Marinetti would often kick off the event by insulting the host city and its dignitaries like the mayor. The ideal ending for the futurists would be a riot spreading out to the streets. That is what they wanted. And they also wanted articles in the newspapers on the next day. Sometimes they might even lead to prosecutions for civil disorder. OK, so they are very antagonistic. You will remember this perhaps from your seminar reading. Um, sometimes they put glue on the seats to piss off the audience before the event started. They might sell the same ticket to up to 10 different people. So they all turn up for the same seat and have an argument. They gave out uh, basically free tickets to weirdos. I think that you know, this, is, this will annoy the person sitting next to this guy. Um, as they come in and check the tickets, they might pinch women. They put dusts on the seats to induce itching and sneezing. The audience, for their part, did all sorts of things to fight back, even at one point handing a revolver to Marinetti on the stage and telling him to kill himself. They threw rotten fruit and veg and eggs at the stage. They used car horns and whistles to disrupt the event. Um, and that's it. So you, can, you get an idea of what was going on and that it was new. Futurist theatre, they said, will be a form of gymnastics that will train our race's mind to the swift, dangerous enthusiasms which have been made necessary by this futurist year. Fascism, as Boris Gross has pointed out, was also something that you could participate in, even if your role is that of the victim. The fascists came to power by activating the masses and creating a situation where it was impossible not to participate. So if you're racially abused on the streets, you are part of that. You can't just ignore it. Uh, other forms that they made beyond the theatre, they took to the streets, they held public meetings tried to instigate riots. They gave speeches, like if you've ever been to London at Hyde Park's um, Speaker's Corner. They created picket lines and strikes and political rallies. They plastered walls with political posters and they made leaflet drops from aeroplanes into Italian piazzas. They held Venice in particularly low regard. They called it a putrid city with a, and a magnificent sore from the past that needed curing. Yet today we think it's a, a beautiful historic city, but remember the situation is that Italy feels a bit embarrassed that it's not as modern as other countries and they don't want to hear about Venice being beautiful. They think it's a, 
a sore from the past that needs curing. In order to restore Venice to a position where it could dominate the Adriatic Sea, they proposed to heal the city by industrializing and militarizing it and by filling the canals, uh, filling in the canals, turning them into roads because roads are more efficient. And they wanted to burn the gondolas. In 1910, the same year that they published um, a text called Against Passeist Venice, sometimes translated as Against Past Loving Venice or, or Traditionalist Venice, um, they launched a three year attack on the city. On one occasion, they heard eight, they hold 80,000 copies of their text Against Past Loving Venice from the bell tower at St Mark's Square. That's the bell tower in the picture there. Um, and they gave a speech that resulted in a brawl. Of course, the futurists were not politically aligned with Dada and surrealism, but uh, anarchists, Dada, communists, surrealists, and fascists, futurists alike, all shared a common disdain for the establishment um, and a burning desire for revolutionary change. So I'm going to sum up part one now and end part one uh, with a quote from Boris Groys. He said, futurism tried to create a total, even totalitarian space, a space that one cannot escape. It is like the carnivalistic space that was later described by Mikhail Bakhtin. If you're part of this, you cannot escape being beaten, being insulted, being pissed on, etc. You are pushed into the active position because there is no way out of it. As a spectator, you find yourself having to defend yourself against the artist, and in doing so, you become part of the artwork. I think that was a real innovation, making the neutral spectatorial position, being a spectator, impossible, and including the spectator by excluding the possibility of being outside. And as we've seen, this is already linked perhaps to fascist politics at the time. And it reminds me of um, a lecture series that I had when I was a master's student, which was called The Terror of Neutrality. And at the time, President George W. Bush, in the wake of 9-11, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, um, said something to the effect of you're either with us or you're against us in the fight against terror. You cannot be neutral. You're either you know, chest pumping American patriot, let's go out there and um, wage war, or you're a terrorist sympathizer. And Bush helped us to understand a complicated world in very simple moral terms. Adam Curtis, the BBC documentary filmmaker, has argued that this dates back to Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. When the world gets too complicated, we retreat into simple moral dichotomies, good and bad, and grey areas are impossible. And the reason that that's dangerous is that it's, it, it's linked to extremist politics like fascism. Part two, we're going to look at it, Russian futurism and beyond Russian futurism. Futurism started in Russia. I'll just go back to that last slide. Um, I've got the Soviet flag on one side and the Russian flag on the other because it started in Russia, which then became the Soviet Union. It started as futurism. Later it developed and was called constructivism, but it was very much linked to Italian futurism and looks very similar. And then something called productivism. Now in Russia, the aim was eventually um, to I've got some message in the chat here. I can't click on the chat or I'll um, lose my presentation. Um, it was me. I'm not sure if um, anyone else had an issue, but the slide is still on Futurist Evening as major event um, and it just keeps loading and loading, but it's not changing any slides. 
OK, you should be able to advance your slides yourself to catch up with me. Uh, we're on slide number 25. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks. OK. Um, it's the one that says names at the top. So as it progressed, as the revolution happens in Russia in 1917, um, they aimed to bring art into line with the Bolshevik revolution. Generally, this included embracing uh, new technologies and the idea that art should be for everyone. So therefore, this meant smashing up the past, which was seen as elitist and conservative. We have um, two models here. So if the traditional model is that you have an artist, an artwork and an audience. Or public. In the new Russian model or futurist model, you have politics, provocation and the use of media. So in Russia, there is a distinctly um, a distinctly unique rejection of the bourgeois. That's the kind of middle class art. Um, and they don't like the idea of individuals producing art. That's seen as um, elitist, so painting bad. Therefore, film became uh, important because, you know, with a movie, there's not just one person that makes it. it? There's a, there is a um, producer, director, actors, editors, cameramen, and so on. So they favoured practices that could be integrated into industrial production and collective reception. We'll see what that means in a minute. And they favoured art with the practical application, applied arts, media production and consumption. Um, so Bishop claims that it, that theatre rather than cinema was more influential on in participatory arts because of its immediacy. You can just take part in it. This is uh, Lenin. There's going to be quite a lot of politics in this lecture and in the whole lecture series. Uh, so I'm assuming that most of you know who Lenin was. Um, he was the first leader of the Soviet Union. Uh, communist revolutionary leader that that overthrew the Tsar there. Lenin was not so concerned with the complete revolution in artistic production. He was more concerned with the fact that he now had 150 million illiterate Russians that you know, can't read and write and a country that badly needs modernizing. The prolet cult which stands for proletarian, which means working class, basically proletarian cultural educational organization for short prolet cult were absolutely committed to defining new forms of proletarian culture. The prolet cult detached creativity from individual seclusion um, and redirected it towards rationally organized production, just like any other industry. In other words, rather than making um, textiles at home in your house in a small cottage industry. They said, let's build a factory, it's more efficient and we will be a more modern country because like Italy, Russia was um, a peasant based country and a bit backward and a bit embarrassed by that. So in the same way they say, don't make something at home by hand, let's industrialize it and make a factory. They said we should do the same for art. You shouldn't stay at home and make a painting on your own. We should have a factory of painting or even better, a factory that produces a new form of art, collective art. This meant that art was subordinated to instrumental ends, um, which were socially directed artistic work. There is much less personal freedom for the artist to express him or herself. 
the beginning or the perhaps the birth of the idea that art should have a social function might be here. Um, they're looking at art and saying it should be useful. It should affect concrete changes in the real world. This can go two ways. So in 2015, Assemble won the Turner Prize. And shortly afterwards, uh, they came up to Lincoln and gave a talk. What they did is um, get together with a community in Liverpool uh, on a street where previous governments had kind of let the street go to rack and ruin because they were encouraging people to move out because they wanted to bulldoze all the old houses down and build new um, flats or designer houses for, for richer people, modernise the area, gentrify the area. But some residents refused to leave and then government policy changed so um, there's all these empty houses now very very cheap but they don't have roofs or whatever so there's a scheme um, to allow people to buy the houses very very cheaply but you have to have the money to do it up you have to promise to do it up and assemble works with people in that community to um, help them produce nicely designed high quality things including that fireplace if you're interested Google them and find out more. So that is arts with an instrumental end. It's community based arts that uh, does some good. On the other hand, going back a bit, 1939, we have um, what, what the prolet cult's idea at the beginning of the revolution evolves into Soviet socialist realism. That is art that is socialist in its message. Here's the message, our glorious leader Joseph Stalin is brilliant and you should trust him and it is realist in its form. You can clearly see who he is. It's a realistic painting. So there's virtually no uh, individual expression here and it becomes a form of propaganda art. You can't really do any other style because the state commissions the artists. Leon Trotsky, it's kind of the three great Russian revolutionary leaders, Lenin, Trotsky and Stalin. Trotsky um, was also against the prolet cult. He believed that new art had to evolve of its own accord and could not be dictated from above, which is what Stalin does. You would all paint like this, otherwise you don't get jobs. In fact, you could be arrested for making uh, bourgeois, sentimental art that um, it's all about you when you're not important. There's a 150 million. We need to modernise the country. We need to be useful. We need to make art that's for everybody. If you want to know more about that, if you're interested in Russian history, the film, uh, the 1960s film Dr. Zhivago um, is an excellent example of that. There's a medical doctor, Dr. Zhivago, who um, writes poetry. He's a published poet and people really like his poetry. And then after the revolution, they don't like his poetry. It's seen as sentimental and individualistic. And that could get him arrested. An enemy of the state. So, in Russia, after this futurist experiment, um, we and the prolet cult comes in, we end up with a, a kind of artistic quandary about equality and quality. So the Russian version of futurism embraced many participants. It was open to all and therefore it was necessarily quite amateur and chaotic. Politically, as we've seen, it's opposed to the big stars. The people were the star, not one individual. There were to be no professionals for this reason. If you've got the professional artist telling everyone what to do, that sounds a lot like the emperor, the czar, telling people what to do, and they don't want that. They want to trust all the working people. They're all equals. What if they became truly Bolshevik in both content and structure, but not very good as art? 
would you rather go back to bourgeois forms of arts like opera or the Bolshoi, famous Russian Bolshoi ballet? Lenin, as we will see, would rather that. So the lack of concern regarding quality means that only a handful of prolific cult plays um, are still in existence today. They weren't documented properly or they're very poor quality and people weren't very interested in them. Um, and, the, and the documentations disappeared. Now this um, video, apparently you have to click play. So click play. There's no sound. I'm going to talk over it and we won't watch all. But this is an example of a great Russian um, futurist experiment. It's a reenactment of the storming of the Winter Palace. That happened in 1917, but you'll see on screen this is the reenactment. It's called the Storming of the Winter Palace 2 from 1920. And it had over 8,000 participants and an additional 100,000 spectators. It was big. The plot is the Bolshevik led Red Guard leads an assault on the Winter Palace to overthrow the old, old um, czarist regime and begin a communist revolution. Now, this production that you're watching on screen was not as chaotic as um, previous versions of spectacular theatre. This was very concise, quite well organised, just one event. There were three separate stages and they ran simultaneously, but only one was lit up at one time. So they had floodlights on a stage and on another stage and you were watching like that. Um, Evrinov, the director, tried to include people who were actually involved in the real events of 1917. And his aim was to turn the recent past, it's only three years ago, into a lived memory, continually reactivated in order to maintain the euphoria of this revolutionary promise. So it's glorifying the past and reminding people what a wonderful um, thing happened. And there's the storming there. Well, you're probably watching it at a slightly different time, but I'm watching them run up the steps with their swords drawn. Uh, we're going to move on. Yes, Robin. Um, you said there was no leaders, but you just said someone organised this. Was this at a different time then? Yeah, he did organise it, didn't he? Um, there were other... So ideally, they, they wouldn't like the single director. And there were um, work-based plays. So factories made their own plays and presented them in the factory. And that's perhaps more of the spirit. Yeah, it's an interesting um, contradiction. Maybe you just can't organise over 100,000 spectators and 8,000 participants without someone in charge. OK, thank you. OK, this leads us to a contemporary artist. Jeremy Della, um, who I don't know if you know this artwork, it's quite famous from 2001. It's called the Battle of All Grieve. It's about the miners' strike when Margaret Thatcher's government in 1984 uh, tried to crush striking miners, take away their power, and close the coal mines and modernise the country. They resisted. Um, the police were sent in. This is in South Yorkshire, kind of close-ish to Sheffield in the village of All Grieve. And they sent police from outside of Yorkshire, southerners often, who might be more, more inclined to hit um, a striking miner. It led to blows. It was a big battle. Um, and Jeremy Della, in a similar way to Evrinov, recreated this using people who were really there. So some of these people are from the um, they're, they're striking miners. There were even police officers used in the recreation. Uh, but some people are actors. He also hired um, people from the, um, what's it called? You know, when you have people that do historical reenactments, the English Historical Reenactment Society, they usually do like the Civil War or something, but he hired them in here and Della directed them. Seems very similar. 
to me. So, Boris Groys has noted that Russian avant-garde art of the Soviet period was not critical, but affirmative in its attitude towards post-revolutionary um, Sovietism. In other words, it glorifies what's already happened. It doesn't, it's not a revolutionary art. It doesn't want to change anything. It wants to keep things going. This means it was conservative, basically a conformist, conformist art. Groys says only art before the revolution was truly revolutionary. Um, those are examples of art after the revolution, glorifying the revolution. So Groys turned to Kazimir Malevich's Black Square painting, not as an active revolutionary gesture in the sense that it explicitly criticizes the political status quo or advertised a coming revolution. Uh, how could it? It's just a black square. But for Groys, it was revolutionary in a much deeper sense. So, uh, how can I explain this? The Russian society at the time um, was one of serfdom, a feudalist society where rich landowners own the land and they probably own the uh, cottages that peasants live in and work for them. So they, you're almost bound to the land in servitude. You're not a slave. You can leave at any point you want, but where are you going to go um, when your, your farmer boss owns your house? And it, they were in a pretty bad state in Russia, pretty backwards. The Tsar had complete control over the country. Um, the church was very powerful and icon paintings were um, very prevalent. So people kind of almost worshipped paintings of saints. Called and often they hung the icon in the best place in their house or bar or other public um, space. And that place would be in the top corner. So if you look at the image on the left, the black square is hung exactly where uh, a religious icon painting would normally be hung. So what does that mean? It means that they are replacing the old uh, religion and old cultural values with something new. They're completely rejecting religion, the king, the czar, um, all our old arts. It's all got to start again. And where do you start? Well, you start with nothing. You start with the building blocks for a new art. So that would mean um, a square, a circle, a triangle, um, and so on. So that's why it's revolutionary. It looks like it's just the black square, but it's the the kind of um, almost aggressive kind of disdain for all old forms of art and culture. I disagree with Malevich and these other um, avant-gardists who sought the total destruction of bourgeois art. I side with Lenin, who did not think that the invention of a new proletarian culture uh, was necessary, but instead advocated, and I quote, the development of the best models, traditions and results of existing culture from the point of view of the Marxist world outlook and the conditions of life and struggle of the proletariat in the period of its dictatorship. In other words, keep all the old stuff, keep all the best stuff and give it to the people. So yes, let's keep Tolstoy and Chekhov, keep the Bolshoi theatre. It achieved something wonderful and positive and art could be, I think, for everybody. 
But in order for it to be for everybody, perhaps we need to rethink it, recontextualize it, and make sure that everybody has access. The theatre, the opera, and the ballet are often expensive. But not only um, it's not only money that stops people from going; it's also people feel that it's not for them. Probably, I'm going to guess, out of the 33 people in this lecture, some of us might also feel like that. That's not for me. I don't go there. I've never been before, so I'm a little bit scared of it or put off. So I side with Lenin, but I also side with Marinetti, the Italian um, founder of Futurism. He said artists with their superior creativity, intuition and vitality. Have an important contribution to make in the process of the renewal. In other words, I think that um, to take the, the example that where Robin asked a question, I think that having a director is a good thing. I think that artists and directors and so on have skills and have valuable contributions to make. I disagree that it's better if everyone just has a go as an amateur. Now, to qualify that, I think that everyone should make art. Even if it's as a hobby, I think that's great. But I think that um, professional training in art, such as an art degree like you're all doing, is also valuable. And if you can, if some people can dedicate more time to studying it and really kind of learning how to do it, um, you end up with more interesting art at the end of the day. So this picture here on the left, uh, Lenin addresses the troops. Maybe you read that while I was talking. Lenin addresses the troops outside the Bolshoi theater in Moscow. Note the year 2013. Obviously, he didn't do that in 2013. The Russian Revolution was in 1917, about 100 years, nearly 100 years earlier. So what's going on here? Well, it's um, you can tell from the reference there that this is an artwork by somebody called Goshka Makuga in 2013. Now, Makuga, um, who is Polish, but um, studied at Central St. Martin's College in London, and lives in London, um, was nominated for the Turner Prize as an artist living and working in England or Britain. She made a series of collages based on two things. The artistic archive of a Czech photographer, um, and my pronunciation of Czech isn't great, so his first name is Miroslav, and the first name is uh, Tichy, which is T-I-C-H-Y with an accent on it. I don't know what that does. Do we have any um, Czech speakers in the room that want to tell me how to pronounce that? You never know. Well, he was um, a dissident under Soviet Czechoslovakia. So he's not in favour of the Soviet regime. He's critical of the Soviet regime in Czechoslovakia. When I say Soviet, of course, Czechoslovakia wasn't part of the Soviet Union, but it was a communist country, um, like a puppet state controlled by Moscow. So he took pictures sneakily, surreptitiously in his hometown. Most of the photographs in his archive present women in everyday and often private situations. Makuga contrasts his photographs with canonical images of the so-called fathers of the communist revolution, adding to official photographs of Lenin and Stalin, images of women living under the realities of the Eastern Bloc. So you can see there's a woman in a kind of swimsuit climbing up um, to the podium where Lenin is. And Makuga has added that. There's a whole series of these photographs. So the posed, um, supposedly pompous photographs of communist leaders are combined with stereotypical views of women from the 1960s in communist countries. Maybe these stereotypical views include gossiping, negligees, sexualized images um, because of Tichy's voyeuristic gaze. And these women are always found on the periphery of scenes presented as if commenting on them from outside of the frame. Makuga's collages, however, combine these various realities and create 
a critical dissonance questioning both Tichy's praxis and the ideological matrix represented by communist propaganda. And I think that's a nice place to end with an artist who has gone over mass um, images, two sets of photographic archives, one from around the time of the revolution in Russia, another from the 60s in, the, in Czechoslovakia. She's brought them together in her individualistic way as a trained artist to create something uh, new. And I, to be honest, I put it in because I wanted to say that I side with Lenin. We should keep the Bolshoi theatre, not don't kill all the ballerinas and call them bourgeois and have some kind of new futurist dance. It's OK to keep that, in my opinion, um, but in some way, evolve it and open it up to other people to have both. So we're going to end with a summary. We began in Italy, futurism began in Italy, and the futurists tried to provoke audiences. The only way that they could fail is if the audience was indifferent. A violent attack on the artists by the audience would have been deemed a success. Remember, they thought of these theatre performances or serata as gymnasiums to train Italians to become more militant. They'd go into the audience, grab them by the collar, slap them about, come on, wake up, we need a revolution. Italian futurists were fascists who wanted to instigate uh, a war to drag Italy into the, the war, but also a revolutionary war against the past. Russian futurism started before the communist revolution, um, but later it developed into constructivism and productivism. Think of productivism, my example of taking the individual, I think I said weaver, but it could be um, a potter or whatever, working in his home. And they say, no, come into the factory, let's industrialize that. We can um, produce more, be more prosperous, and Russia can be dragged into the 20th century. And in the same way, productivists thought that uh, that you could or should be able to um, industrialize art. And as a result, uh, I, I showed you um, two examples of art from that kind of period earlier. One was the statue glorifying the revolution. The other was a poster, the woman shouting on a diagonal. You might know uh, you might know it from the Franz Ferdinand album cover. It's quite a famous image. Um, and that's by Alexander Rodchenko. It's one of the earliest examples of graphic design. So the Russians were pioneering new forms of art, but not as art really, as, as, um, as something that's useful, useful for propaganda purposes or educational purposes. The post-revolutionary productivists didn't need to antagonise anyone, though. It's not provoca provocative because the people had already risen up and overthrown the ruling classes. Now what they want to do is glorify the past. Which makes it conservative as an art form. Um, they do at the same time, though, want to activate people into cultural production, so it is participatory. They want to demonstrate that a new type of everyday person um, can make art. And they thought that was preferable to bourgeois arts of the past, which had very little concern for the average Russian. <laughs>